Elaine is the Professor of Child and Family Studies in the School for, Social Policy, sorry, School for Policy Studies at the University of Bristol. And again, she's got a long and um, glittering research career looking at issues around child protection, child welfare, and kinship care, as well as adoption. So we're really looking forward to your presentation this morning, or this afternoon now. Thank you, Elaine. Well, I'm very pleased to um, be here to uh, talk to you about this uh, study we did, which was uh, aiming to fill some of the gaps in knowledge about how neglected children and their parents are worked with over time and to try to understand how we might go about improving their outcomes. And as um, we just heard, it is, a, it is quite rare to be able to follow children up for periods of time because funding doesn't usually allow for that. Um, and so I think you'll find that what we found is very interesting since we had that um, rather unusual opportunity. The research followed up um, a cohort of neglected children who'd been looked after and then reunified with a parent and it had three broad aims. Firstly, to examine the case management interventions and outcomes of a consecutive sample of neglected children. And we actually went back right to the point of first referral to children's services until they subsequently were in care, returned home, and then we followed them up for another five years. So that's a very long follow-up. We looked at which factors were related to their outcomes at this five-year follow-up. And then we explored through in-depth interviews with social workers whether there were particular issues in these cases of neglect which makes the work more demanding. We worked in seven local authorities and focused on 138 neglected children who had been returned to their parents during a one-year period. And we followed them up then first for two years and then subsequently at the five-year point, by which time they were aged five to 19. And what we did was we reviewed their case files from start to finish and we interviewed social workers about 50 of the children in the sample. We, the, in this sample, um, as of 59% uh, of the children were boys, one in five were from a black or minority ethnic background, and by the five-year follow-up, over a quarter of the children were aged five to nine, a quarter were 10 to 14, and just under half were 15 to 19. And just to give you an idea of the neglect that they'd experienced, we categorised it in this way, and we found that um, most of the children had had a lack of any or appropriate supervision at some stage. Many had been physically neglected or emotionally neglected, educational, meaning very infrequent attendance at nursery or school affected almost half of them, or a major lack of stimulation, and a third of them hadn't been taken for key health appointments. These are the sort of children who were not taken for um, follow-up when they, for conditions like eye conditions, for example, that unfollowed up will leave them with major impairments in later life. Most children had experienced multiple types of neglect, and for over half, we felt the neglect was moderately severe, whilst for a third, it was very severe. But as you'd expect, in addition to neglect, most of these children had also been abused, in particular emotionally and physically abused, and more rarely, sexually abused. Their parents, in turn, were affected, as we might expect, by alcohol or drugs misuse, by mental health problems and domestic abuse. And concerns had been voiced about these children from very early on in their lives so that there was a potential to help them early. It's not that these children are not known. Unlike those we were hearing about earlier uh, who are subject to very violent incidents, these children with chronic neglect actually are known to services. Over half of them were referred to children's services before they were age two, including a third before they were born. And by the time they started school, three quarters of them had been referred. So we do actually have opportunities to intervene rather more decisively than we're doing at the moment. Three-fifths of the parents, in our view, needed more help than they got, particularly with their children's behaviour, 
in relation to their parenting skills and with their alcohol and drugs problems and domestic violence. And we found that a lack of specialist help for parents was statistically linked to poorer outcomes for the children at follow-up. So what we do or don't do in relation to helping these children, sorry, helping the parents, actually makes a difference when we follow them up later um, to how the children get on. And three-fifths of the children we thought needed more assistance, especially the teenagers, reflecting what we've just heard from, from Mike. The teenagers especially often received insufficient support in relation to their often extremely severe problems. And also, when services were provided, they were often not at a sufficiently intensive level to meet the severity of parents and children's needs in order to make and sustain change. So we were hearing before about various levels and, and lengths of follow-up. These are often very chronic uh, problems that parents have, so a little help may not really touch things very much. There were quite high levels also of continuing abuse and neglect. At our two-year follow-up, 59% of these children had been abused or neglected again after going home from care. So we'd taken them into care, they'd gone home, they'd been re-abused or neglected. And then in the following three years, half of the children were again abused or neglected. And in terms of stability, um, by the five-year follow-up, two-thirds of the returns had broken down. So although we were returning them home uh, from care, most of the returns did not actually endure at that stage. And in fact, worryingly, in half of the families, the children had had two or more failed returns home. And children with two or more failed returns home ended up with the very poorest well-being of any of the children. So we need to keep an eye on this issue and take much more decisive action to provide stability for these children who otherwise will do extremely badly. So what we did was we looked at the management of the um, cases. We looked right back to the first referral on every child. We followed it through until whatever stage it was the child uh, went into care. Then we followed for another five years uh, after that return. So these are, this is a very long-term follow-up. And what I need, I'm going to say needs to be taken in that context. Um, and a range of issues were very evident in what was happening in this work with the parents and children. And first of all, assessments were overall pretty infrequent, except in uh, care proceedings when assessments could be very helpful in making decisions about whether children should or shouldn't be returned to their parents. And sometimes that really was the only time when there was real clarity of planning for the children. And also, after the children were returned to their parents, children's services departments received referrals, about three-quarters of them. In three-fifths of the families, these referrals about abuse or neglect were not adequately followed up, or the children were not made safe. So there was clear indications of risk, and for a variety of reasons, uh, some of those were simply not either investigated properly or, they, or what, when they were looked at, they were not, action wasn't taken. Also, at times, I'm sure you'd be very familiar with this um, big issue in neglect cases, the number and range of family and child problems made working with the families very difficult because the parents often have such overwhelming difficulties that you struggle to deal uh, with them and keep an eye on the children's progress. And we did find that in quite a few of the families, key problems had not actually been addressed, especially, and I have to emphasize this, parental alcohol and drugs misuse. That in my view, is the big area that we are not dealing with adequately. And it's, of course, that one of the major reasons these children come to our attention. Also, sometimes domestic violence and mental health problems and poor parenting skills were also not being adequately addressed. And also, as you won't be at all surprised to hear, there was often too little therapeutic help for children who had emotional and behavioural problems. And neglected young people whose behaviour problems had not been addressed earlier on, often went on to have very poor outcomes as their behaviour deteriorated further. And you could just watch these, uh, the children who were presenting for neglect very early, who were getting sporadic attention, nothing very um, major going on, often not a lot of protection, 
growing into teenage years, becoming involved in offending, drugs use, self-harm, and so on. And you literally could watch them as you read through the files. Also, oh, there, were, there were many reports of children suffering chronic neglect, including missed medical appointments and missed school, lack of stimulation, and sometimes a gross failure to put on weight. There was not much evidence of consistent monitoring of children's weight, height, and development, which might later have formed the basis of a case in court if needed. And I'll come back to that later because I think it is really a key issue. And when conditions were set for parents to make changes and they weren't complied with, quite often no action was taken. Uh, there were no consequences for the parents. So what we're teaching parents in that situation is you don't actually have to do what we say because we don't follow up on it. It's not a good lesson for parents to take, and they do take it. And also we thought that in as many as two-fifths of the cases, the parents had been given too many chances to make changes by the professionals. And that's something I think many of the studies found. If, when you read the histories, the chances, you know, this is a chance, oh, we'll forget that, oh, it's gone wrong again, oh, well, we'll forget it. On and on and on. It was also rare, and we were hearing about this early, and we, we've known this for a long time, for entry to care to take place because of an accumulation of concerns about children. And that, of course, is the essence of neglect. Decisive action often awaited a trigger incident of physical or sexual abuse or a particularly serious incident of domestic violence. And we all know that, don't we? But we have to find ways to get these children into court if they need it without waiting for a trigger incident because it's sheer chance when that comes along and how old they are. And there's no doubt these are very difficult cases to deal with. There were difficulties in engaging two-thirds of the mothers and half of the father figures, not a lot of focus on involving fathers. And in, over and above that, parents actively resisted or tried to sabotage work in as many as two-fifths of the cases. And a third of the young people were not easy to engage. So I don't think we're talking here about empowering parents. We're talking about parents who need a very tight form of working. It can be difficult to deal with parents who don't engage readily. And actually, in a fifth of families, the case was closed for that reason. And the cases of quite a number of families were closed when there was clear evidence that the underlying problems were still in existence. So we then looked at um, how cases were managed over time. And we found four very broad patterns. Encouragingly, case management was proactive throughout in a quarter of the cases. And that was a considerable achievement because when you're looking at the very long periods of time, we were often following these cases through. In a number of those cases, an initial child protection conference was held before the child's birth, or care proceedings or actions to accommodate children happened soon after birth. In all of them, once concerns about the children had been recognised, children's social care moved to protect children and plan for their future. The parents were given the chance to show they could care for the children safely, but action was taken if they couldn't. And often care proceedings or child protection plans were being used effectively, either to protect children, bring about increased cooperation from the parents, or if that wasn't forthcoming, to plan for permanence outside the family. Then the case management of another quarter of families was initially proactive uh, along the lines that I've just described. Children's services were taking appropriate action early on to protect children and plan for their future, but as time wore on, the management became passive. And this was a pattern that you could particularly see as children got older and were seen as less vulnerable and rather difficult teenagers, even though you know, that's the presentation you get from teenagers later on. Then another quarter of cases were passively managed initially, but the management later became proactive, and that included those that were managed as family support cases for too long, where a build-up of concerns would have made earlier child protection intervention more appropriate. And then in the final quarter of cases, the case management was passive throughout. Here, children were left to suffer harm without enough intervention, sometimes over pretty long periods, their cases, were, when they were open, were treated as family support, and abuse, neglect, and rejection of the children was minimised. Parental problems like alcohol and drugs misuse or mental health difficulties got, didn't get much attention, and children then went on experiencing these adversities, 
that were caused by living with parents with those difficulties. And overall, there was a lack of direction in these cases and not much permanence planning. And interestingly, there were major local authority variations in how proactively cases were managed. So you get a third proactively managed in one local authority and only 11% in two others. And this led to very much better outcomes for children in some authorities than others. So I think you can see from that evidence that a lot of it is actually down to what we do or don't do, that we have opportunities and we make choices or we sort of things happen that mean we either you know, do or don't uh, work effectively to protect these children. I personally don't think it's really about definition or identifying them. We kind of often know them. It's what we do that matters. And just to give you an example of the sort of case that we thought of as a proactively managed, obviously I've changed the names, an initial child protection conference was held before Susie was born and she was made subject to a child protection plan and care proceedings were started soon after her birth. She then went to a residential mother and baby unit from hospital and her mother was encouraged, sorry, was engaged with professionals and committed to caring for her. And then after a positive assessment, Susie and her mother moved to a flat with an excellent package of support and a supervision order was made. However, a year later, her mother was hospitalised because of mental health problems. Susie went into foster care and at the age of two and a half, care proceedings were initiated when the mother threatened to remove her from voluntary care. The psychiatric assessment of this mother during the care proceedings gave a very poor prognosis, so a plan was made for adoption. So as you can see, that case was held and managed in its different forms as it went along. At the other end of the spectrum, Frank's mother had learning difficulties and her first two children were placed for adoption. And after Frank was born, there were many referrals about his mother's drinking, his neglect, her neglect of him, leaving him unsupervised, and sexual abuse by a neighbour. When he was seven, he was seriously injured in a fall and from the age of eight was showing sexualised behaviour. The health visitors' requests for a case conference were refused and Frank was finally accommodated at the age of 11 and then had 10 placements in quick succession with a brief return to his mother who was overdosing and misusing drugs. Yet at the age of 14, he returned to his mother again in spite of the service manager writing on the file that he had grave reservations about that happening. And it wasn't until he was 15 that care proceedings were discussed in a review meeting, but no action was taken. And I'm sorry to say that was, you know, not just the most graphic example I could pull out. There's, there's a quarter of cases that in various ways reflect that hands-off N not getting involved, not looking after the children approach. So how can we begin to understand the processes which might affect how cases are managed and worked with over time? We found that there are a number of what we have called inescapable errors at work because I would argue they are always likely to affect practice over time, especially obviously an issue when we're talking about working with neglected children and their families. And if it's true, because some of these are psychological processes you can't just wish away, we need to think how we interrupt them, how we deal with them, rather than imagine that by exhortation they will sort of go away. So what sort of processes are we talking about? Well, they won't be unfamiliar to you, but one is becoming desensitised to the extent of children's difficulties because... In medium to long term work, we become very habituated to the difficulties in, uh, in, the, in a particular family. So we may underplay their recurrence. That means that we may be normalising and minimising abuse and neglect. And I'm sure you've all seen it. You know, referrals of various sorts in certain families do not excite our attention in the way they do with, fa with families where we don't know the children. For example, Cases where referrals from schools or health visitors about risks to children were simply not followed up. And then there is a big one, which is something we can do something about, which is downgrading the importance of referrals about abuse or neglect from neighbours or relatives, who I would argue often have a very accurate view of what's going on. But we have this notion that they might be malicious. Well, the job is to go and find out what's going on, because the chances are somebody has observed something very important going on. But that was a typical thing that was happening in these cases. Also, it's natural that social workers will 
sometimes over-identify with parents at the expense of children. And we know that there is a very well-known psychological phenomenon where we all develop a fixed view of cases fairly early on, and that's often then not affected by contrary information, and that might be one of the explanations why if we've decided this is a family in which, well, there's some abuse, but we can, you know, it's all right, that we don't follow up on subsequent referrals about it. And a very important one, obviously, is that very often we are viewing each incident of neglect or abuse in isolation and not recognising their cumulative impact on children. And I'd say that's a difficult thing to do. We have to think, how would we do it? And it relates to the next point, which is many workers do not have the um, privilege that we have as researchers. I will go in and I will read the case files from however many there are from start to finish over one or two days or whatever it takes. Not many workers have that. So it, and yet it's absolutely critical with neglect to have the child's whole history in mind and hold it in mind so that you can see the, the repetitive pattern of neglect or injury um, and the likely impact on children. I, I mean, I've interviewed social workers about their practice and they were quite excited because they were actually taking action. And I knew that that action was taken 10 years previously without any... But they didn't because, you know, it is a very difficult thing to hold in mind the whole history. Somehow we have to find a way of doing that, in my view. I mean, obviously chronologies would help, but we need to use chronologies extremely actively and contextualise each new referral and incident within that pattern. Also, another context within was that in some authorities the thresholds for action were high, for example the threshold for holding an initial conference, so that there was an expectation that things had to be absolutely extraordinarily uh, dangerous for anybody to do anything. I'm sure that some of the local authorities were anxious to avoid taking children into care for a variety of reasons. One of them is that the um, bad um, press that it's had, which we now know is not really deserved, that children in care have problems because of the previous maltreatment they've had, not because of the care experience by and large. And often in these cases there is drift and delay, especially if there were staff shortages or changes of social worker. So having looked at some of those processes, I want to talk to you about how child protection procedures were used, how effective they were. Um, well, we found that there were major local authority variations in the proportion of children at risk who were not made subject to a child protection plan. So the thresholds were being set very high in some local authorities for holding conferences or making plans. In this sample, 72% of the children were made subject to a child protection plan at some point. And this was usually helpful to practice, it brought about some positive changes, encouraged parental cooperation. Although in two-fifths of the cases, children were not being adequately protected whilst the plan was in place. This is where there were continuing referrals about abuse and neglect which were not reaching the threshold for more action to protect children. So let's look now at what happened in terms of care proceedings. Because we thought, having followed these children's histories through and seeing them deteriorate very much, affected by this continuing uh, neglect, we thought those who got into care proceedings would finally be made safe. And we were shocked to find that that was not the case. The story was by no means that simple. So we need to look very carefully at what happens in terms of the courts. They, two thirds of these children did go into care proceedings, and, but in 15 families, care proceedings were not taken, even though the children were living in such unsatisfactory situations that care proceedings would have been justified. Some of these cases were those where they, it was thought there was insufficient evidence for care proceedings, big issue we know with some local authority legal departments providing excessively cautious advice, as happened to Peter Connolly, for example. So it's very important that managers take an authoritative stance and say when they think it has to go into proceedings, because you may have very cautious legal advisers. That's not going to help you. 
We judged that a quarter of the children had been left too long with their parents in very adverse circumstances before care proceedings got started. These were situations where children were suffering prolonged neglect and sometimes also abuse, but the response was one of family support again and again. And once such a pattern of non-response was established, it could become entrenched so that interview incidents uh, of abuse and neglect were being viewed one by one rather than their cumulative impact being recognised. Then when they did get to court, supervision orders were made and in over three-fifths of the cases of supervision orders, the situation at home broke down. Sometimes we found guardians and expert assessors had been too anxious to give children, give parents the benefit of having yet another chance, even though a deeper reading of the history might have shown that was not advisable. So Marion Brandon has talked about the start again phenomenon, referring to fieldwork staff. Here we have the start again phenomenon where guardians and expert assessors are exercising it. And you know, it must be incredibly frustrating if you're the social worker and then you get this feeble uh, kind of start again thing where the history tells you the parents will not do more than minor adjustments and then they'll revert. Then when we look at the children who were returned home to parents on care orders, the returns broke down in 87% of the cases, in most of them. And in, what was very worrying was that in spite of that, plans for permanence outside the family were rather rarely made for these children. They became subject to a kind of planning blight. Now, you might have views about why that happened, but I suspect there was some feeling that, you know, if we can't get a, you know, a care order with, uh, uh, you know, with an expectation to, to be away from the family, you know, we don't know what to do. So those children were often in a bit of a limbo. Although, technically, you do have the right to place them properly uh, in a permanent family. Care orders with plans for permanence outside the family uh, were mostly successful, although a quarter of those children didn't actually achieve a stable permanent placement. When you pull all those together, the plans made during care proceedings didn't work out in nearly two-fifths of cases, which is pretty staggering, isn't it? Yeah. So, if we look at what happened at the end of our five-year period, we found that two-fifths of the children had achieved stability at home, either in that original return or in a later one, but more rather worryingly, a third of those children who were stably at home had poor or very poor well-being. So just because they're at home doesn't mean they're doing all right. Those were not, you know, not decisions we would really, if we investigated them further, have wanted to uphold. 29% had achieved permanence in adoption, foster or kinship care, and the 28% had following the end of their original return, very unstable experiences, lots of placements, a mixture of care, placements and returns, oscillating between the two, and their well-being was very poor. 70% had poor or very poor well-being. So the outcomes, a uh, lot of room to improve the outcomes. What did we find was related to those outcomes? Well. Proactive case management was most often a feature of the stable away from home and the stable at home groups, whereas in the unstable group, passive case management predominated. So again, we're making a very direct link with what we do and what happens to children in terms of their outcomes. There were major local authority differences in stability outcomes, and this is a bit startling, but if a child was not looked after in the poorest performing local authority, they were 10 times more likely to be in a stable placement than if they were. So, you know, local authority variations means local authority variations in practice are making a huge difference to the outcomes of children. Further analysis showed that children who were under the age of six at return were most likely to find stability in an alternative placement if the original return wasn't successful. For children who were over the age of six, their cases were less well managed they had much less chance of achieving permanence in care, and they more often later had unstable outcomes, and most of the children who were over 12 at return had unstable outcomes. So we are focusing most on the under six, and from then on our practice lacks the same kind of coherence as it does has for the younger children. So some of the key messages, I think, is that we can see that lots of the factors which are associated with outcomes 
are related to how the cases are worked with. So there is a need for earlier and more effective intervention and more proactive practice, especially with these children who are six or over. The fact that most of the children had actually been known to children's services before they went to school shows the opportunities had been there to intervene more decisively earlier on. But intensive services are going to be required if changes are to be made by parents, especially around uh, drug and alcohol problems, parenting skills, and managing children's and teenagers' uh, behaviour. It's also clear that practice when returning children to their parents uh, needs to be more authoritative and to focus explicitly on what needs to change before return is possible. We need to set concrete targets clearly, monitor them by means of written agreements. We need to then supply the services that would be needed to help people improve and set clear contingency plan so that if, and timescales so that if parents can't make the changes that are needed within children's timescales, it needs to be quite clear to parents that other plans will be made for their children. At the moment, we're not working in that kind of what I'd call authoritative way, and that allows for drift. But it's one way of testing parental capacity is to set reasonable tasks with good support. If parents don't meet them, you are either you're looking at an issue of parental capacity or motivation. Either way, that's unlikely. You know, that is not going to be a, a viable situation. Also, we need to watch out for these repeatedly returned children because they ended up with very poor well-being. And I would argue that we need to pick them up at review and really act much more decisively. Parental alcohol and drugs misuse, huge issue. Significant gaps in the services for parents with drugs and especially with alcohol misuse problems. The children who'd been the most severely neglected, the children whose well-being at follow-up was the poorest, were those who'd been living with parents with alcohol misuse problems because we, we do least to ensure that those parents are in treatment. Uh, in effect, we normalise alcohol problems. So those parents need clear expectations that they will be required to address their substance misuse before children are returned to them, and that their use of substances will be closely monitored and reviewed before and during return. And so to do that, we need more access to treatment for parental substance misuse problems and more training for practitioners in working with substance misusers, especially in guarding against misplaced optimism. We know that substance misusers need very tight controls um, and sometimes need a wake-up call, otherwise they will not change their behaviour. I'd also argue that we need to develop what I'm calling court-informed practice, because I, as I say, the children who'd experienced the most severe neglect had the poorest outcomes. And we know that working effectively with neglected children and their parents is far from easy. I think what we need to do is for local authorities to become very clear about how to make a case in care proceedings for neglect cases. We need to talk to their legal departments, absolutely be clear about what would be needed, and then start to develop a way of working which from the very beginning is systematically building up uh, and reviewing evidence of children's progress or lack of it, including charting their weight gains and developmental and other progress, and certainly charting the written agreements that are made and how often they're kept or broken, because that kind of evidence is going to be needed for care proceedings, and it should help practitioners recognise when thresholds for action have been reached. And it would stop this situation, which is quite common, where you go to the legal department and they say, oh, but we need certain sorts of evidence now, you know, so you can forget the last three years of work and start from scratch, which is devastating for children's timetables. So we need to work in that way from the beginning, and I would argue it would be helpful, make it easier to recognise the point at which um, you, you move more, more decisively. And um, the other thing is that since a range of processes are always going to uh, lead to inescapable errors, we should be thinking how we can deliberately interrupt them if we're going to improve practice. One of the ways might be by getting a second social worker, perhaps a senior practitioner, to do joint visits in all child protection cases every, say, four to six months, to provide a second pair of eyes to review thresholds for intervention, and to advise and discuss 
case management. Personally, if I was working in the cases, I would welcome having a second pair of eyes, someone else who can look at my case and help me think about where I've got to and what's happening. And if we are, and we all are, going to be becoming desensitised to maltreatment, the second worker can step out of that and um, think about it. And since the poor outcomes of children returned to their parents on supervision and care orders calls into the question make the decision making in courts, I think that what's needed is that the medium term outcomes of court decisions are fed back to magistrates and the judiciary to enable them to get feedback on the efficacy of their decisions. And that kind of feedback also needs to be given to expert assessors and guardians. I mean, I don't know how people judges and magistrates can improve their decision making when they have no idea whether that heartfelt return worked out. And if, you know, if they have such a poor, and I mean, our study shows a very, very high failure rate, you know, they've got no feedback mechanism to improve their decision making. And I think this is actually being explored at the moment. The, this has been taken on board by the Judicial Review, and I think it, you know, it's being looked at as a serious um, issue. So, our study shows how challenging working with neglected children and their families is, but also that practice does have a powerful influence on children's outcomes. Most of the children in our study were known to children's services before they started school, yet too few were adequately protected. But it, the findings suggest that a more robust and authoritative approach to working with neglect is needed, and that barriers to effective practice need to be addressed if the outcomes for these children is to be improved. And that's just a note of our book and one of the articles we've written on the study. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Elaine. Thank you for your very powerful messages about the impact of our practice on long-term outcomes for neglected children. I think the study, the content of the study makes for a very powerful read and again, I really hope that after hearing um, Elaine and the other presenters speak, you will go and look at the source material. We've probably got room for one or two, depending on the length of the questions, before we break for lunch. Just picking up on the, the comment about the courts, and I'm putting my family magistrate hat on now. Um, one thing I would be interested in is, to, um, is whether uh, local authorities actually look at whether... Um, what, what is behind decisions that are, don't go through. So if they apply for a care order and it doesn't go through, um, whether they review the paperwork because um, hopefully the, the revisions that are being made in terms of the paperwork, the volume, the quality will make a, a lot of difference. But in certain circumstances, hands are tied because of the, the poor quality of the paperwork, um, the length of time things have been going on, um, and, and the position of the guardian, actually, um, in a lot of cases. So I think there's a lot of factors going on. But I think if it's a two-way thing, that actually the courts look at mm. the impact of the decisions and the local authorities look at the processes involved, I think we're, we'll get some way towards getting a more effective system. Yeah, thank you. That's a very interesting comment. I mean, I certainly think that local authorities may well need to talk to their local judiciary uh, and magistrates where um, there are a lot of um, cases that they bring uh, are not leading to the outcomes they'd plan. Certainly in one of the local authorities in our study, I realised that one of the things that was happening was that their courts, for whatever reason, were extremely reluctant to make care orders uh, only and occasionally made supervision orders, and they had more or less stopped taking cases to court. And the, the kind of blowback effect on their practice was absolutely massive. It, it, you know, I, I can only assume that that was one of the reasons why practice then became very, very passive. Uh, so, yeah, I think you do need discussion uh, on both sides uh, in order to understand it. But what I think was happening in that authority was there was a kind of a mentality about avoiding... Um, you know, permanence at all costs, which, was, which, which I think should be taken up at very senior levels, and vice versa if there are problems in the way the case is presented. No, so just very quickly, if you'd like to pass the microphone to the lady behind you in blue, we'll take one last question before lunch. Thank you. I just wondered if you think we're making enough use of child assessment orders, because I think we're actually missing out on some of the legal options we've got for actually going to court. I've never understood why we don't uh, use child assessment orders, and it is a really good question. I don't know the answer because, you know, you, you quite often see situations where people kind of 
give up because they can't get uh, minimal compliance. And I think a child assessment order is, is made for that situation. I really don't know why we aren't using them. Maybe somebody from an authority could, could comment. Thank you very much, Elaine. We, we will need to close now for lunch, but I know that all the um, presenters this morning would be very happy to talk with you over lunch break. Just before we close the morning session, I'd like to thank Ruth Gil Gilbert, Harriet Ward, Mike Steen and Elaine Farmer for their very interesting presentations.